Have you ever wanted to get into a new fandom, only to be overwhelmed with discouragement from all the confusion of canon and lore changes? Do the fans of certain intellectual properties just rub you the wrong way? Sadly, Star Trek is no exception to this misery. There was a time when I may have argued the Trek fanbase being one of the greatest and most welcoming, and I think in a lot of misunderstood ways we still are. The biggest dividing factor, of course, is brought about in current era Trek, and whether or not it's real Star Trek. As a fan of anything, I tend to take issues with statements like that, because it's very elitist and divisive, but I think there is a set metric, especially with Star Trek, that we can establish what makes real Star Trek, and a real fan versus a misguided fan versus a shill poser. But to get to that, first, I want to thank our sponsor, us. We've self-monetized, and if you're looking for a simple donation tier you can forget about, we've got you covered. Your $3 a month, or $36 annual write-off, will give you the peace of mind of supporting our independent content and helps us continue to grow, which in turn will bring you more content. We do also have options through Cash App and PayPal if you prefer a one-time tip. And of course, please like, share, and subscribe. We need to agree to what real Star Trek is. And to do that, we need to watch all of Star Trek. So go ahead and pause and watch every episode and film. I look forward to reading your comments and feedback in several months when you come back and finish the video. To understand what real Star Trek is, we need to agree to where it all went... different. We need to agree to what Star Trek is and what it's supposed to be, and we need to accept the fact that beyond a few core ideas, we aren't always going to agree, and that's okay. Our diversity of thoughts and ideas is what makes us great as a species. On September 6th, 1966, Canadians first witnessed what would be a long-time cult classic that slowly grew and influenced a lot of the modern-day pop culture spheres and gathering places. This show pioneered many firsts, all of which can be learned about on the official Star Trek website or the many enthusiastic fan channels that deep dive and discuss Trek's influence often. Even on this channel, we talk about Trek's past and overall impact. Today, however, I am looking to establish its core ideas of tolerance, acceptance, overcoming differences, and generally respecting each other as equals, regardless of any personal beliefs. These are the qualities that define a Star Trek fan. Not excuses to ignore those ideals when it's politically convenient, but rather guidelines and principles that any human can understand and apply to their lives to live as better examples for others. Ideas that are very personal to me because they are also similar to my personal faith and ideology, but more importantly, they are good and true and prove themselves when you choose to live by them. Don't get me wrong, we're all human, and I mess these up often, but I want to learn from my mistakes as I want you to learn from yours. The ideas of Star Trek also offer a better standard of living and way of life for all humans. But to get to that, we need to agree on what real Star Trek is, or as I prefer to call it, Roddenberry Star Trek. All Star Trek is real in some form or another. You can pop a story, but you cannot destroy an idea. Don't you understand? That's ancient knowledge. You cannot destroy an idea. That future, I created it, and it's real. Don't you understand? It is real. I created it. Where does my fan credibility come from? My favorite Star Trek is Deep Space Nine, and Star Treks 1 through 6, or as I like to lovingly refer to them as TOS Season 4, followed by Enterprise, then Picard Season 3, the first episode of Strange New Worlds, and nine episodes from the second season. I thought Discovery Season 1 had some promise. It was a departure from Trek, but it all ended up making sense in the end because the season had more to do with the Mirror Universe. I stopped watching after Season 2. Season 1 of Picard did not keep my interest, and even clips from Season 2 weren't enough to pull me back in. When I heard Season 3 was a fan service reunion special, I figured I would give it a try. And, well, the season did what it needed to. It played all the right fan service cards while making TNG look badass, and doing what I feel all the Next Generation movies failed to do. Keep in mind, this is just my opinion. Think of this as establishing myself as a fan and why I feel I am authority to help determine the exact point Roddenberry's Star Trek ended and the Star Trek multiverse began. I don't have a supreme bias because if there's anything Star Trek taught me, it's that you shouldn't have any at all except maybe for your friends and family, but never at the expense of the truth. 
The first duty of every Starfleet officer is to the truth, whether it's scientific truth or historical truth or personal truth. It is the guiding principle on which Starfleet is based. Now, if you can't find it within yourself to stand up and tell the truth about what happened, you don't deserve to wear that uniform. And so, I give my thoughts and opinions on Star Trek and everything truthfully. What I've found in my discussions with fans of varying degrees is consistent disagreement. Everyone has their hard opinions on Star Trek and that's fine. That's what fuels our passions and love for the series. It's what helps inspire our own creativity. Being a real Star Trek fan means respecting the core ideas and the origin of the show itself. Now, you do not have to love or even like TOS to be a Star Trek fan. I get it. It's not for everyone. It isn't really for me except for select episodes, and all of the motion picture films, five included. However, it is suggested you try to find at least one favorite original series episode, and no shame if it's trouble with Tribbles. So yes, levy the criticism you feel it needs, and let's have those discussions about the product of its time, but do so respectfully. Do so as a Star Trek fan. Agree to disagree and discuss something more common or productive. If you don't respect the core ideas of, well, respect, then you miss the entire point. Have your people never put down civil unrest? Negotiation. Debate. These are the tools to build a lasting peace. Anson Mount, as Christopher Pike said this in Season 1, Episode 1 of Strange New Worlds, and though Strange New Worlds isn't Roddenberry Trek, it is drawing from the core idea of Roddenberry Trek. It respects the core principles. No, it's not perfect TOS Trek, but it doesn't need to be. Roddenberry Trek has already happened. Roddenberry Trek will always be, but never again. All the complaints and issues I hear against 2017 Plus Trek begin in Star Trek Generations. The biggest sins this movie commits are seen in some of the newer versions of Star Trek, but those are new takes on an already established and near-perfect idea. No matter what multiverse Trek produces, it will never change what's been established in Roddenberry Trek. Roddenberry Trek is over and done. Shows that even try to follow the Roddenberry Bible will maybe last two or three seasons because eventually the rules will force the show into a circle but it's appropriate considering Roddenberry Trek is timeless, despite the Roddenberry model being a three-time proven failure. TOS was cancelled after only three seasons, the motion picture performed poorly at the box office, and the next generation needed to make changes for its third season in order to attract a wider audience. I think what angers me the most about this movie is that, for the first half, I was actually enjoying it. It felt like a TNG episode that was stretched into a two-parter. But, as it went on, I quickly felt my intelligence being insulted to a point where I felt the need to pause the movie and scream at it. This is not the sign of good cinema. Or a healthy human being. How is it that the TNG crew, which peaked their performance in Season 7 and were off to new things, suddenly got this uncharacteristically stupid? I, I mean, what is this? Who are these people? It's like the last seven years didn't happen. These are supposedly the same people, yet they are behaving worse than in Season 1. Our problems quickly begin near the end of the film when Shatner meets Stewart, or rather where Kirk meets Picard and the never-ending debate of who's better can finally be resolved by both of them working together or something. Yeah, spoiler alert for this movie that is almost 20, or excuse me, 30... Oh... Oh my god... I am old. 30-year-old film. That's right, Star Trek died almost 30 years ago, and I can prove it with more not-so-nitpicky nitpicks. So anyway, Kirk meets Picard is where our movie begins. Or, rather, where the writers started writing the story. You see, concept writing can be fun, but it requires a lot of creative liberties to execute, and if you take too much, well, you end up forcing your characters, characters that were built up to be bright, intelligent Starfleet officers, to suddenly behave uncharacteristically dumb because the plot needs them to. This is seen in continued iterations of Trek, especially in Discovery. But also, Enterprise committed this offense, or so it seemed, with the Vulcans, and it impacted how fans viewed that show. It wasn't until later, when we learned that Archer helped set the Vulcans on their way, that them being out of character was the point. They weren't the Vulcans we meet in Kirk's era. This was still the Wild West days of space exploration. But again, Generations set the precedent, and Enterprise was a prequel. 
Generations was a sequel to TNG Season 7, or rather the closing of Roddenberry Trek and the beginning of Multiverse Trek. The movie actually starts with the christening of the Enterprise B. This was an interesting bit, the crew passing on the torch to the new captain, who, I guess, cheated on all his exams and should not have been placed on that bridge. Or, maybe he just caves hard when being on camera. Either way, maybe select a new captain or put an admiral on the bridge with Captain Tuesday for a patrol or five. Kirk gives his life to save the Enterprise, which is a fitting way to go, and all is well with the Roddenberry timeline. We then fast forward to the 24th century, where Worf is pinning on Lieutenant Commander. I actually love this scene. For all the times Worf makes people put up with Klingon tradition, they haze him Navy sailor style. It was all appropriate and keeping in tradition with where Trek was at by this time. Then Picard gets a distressing message and has to leave. Riker, getting giddy to play sailor some more, has to go to the bridge to respond to a distress call. This leads the crew to a monitoring post, which was attacked by unknown assailants using disruptors, leaving three possible choices. From here, they find a survivor who just happened to be saved by the Enterprise B earlier in the film. Turns out he's a nut job trying to get back to some magical nexus thingy and will kill anyone and destroy anything to get there. As Picard learns from Guinan that Soren is a danger to be trifled with, he's conveniently left the Enterprise already and returned to the listening post where he encounters comic relief emotion ship Data, who is quickly overwhelmed with fear. As Riker is trying to extract everyone, Soren engages them in a firefight and gets away with Geordi on a 20-year-old Klingon bird of prey commanded by the Duras sisters. Woo. Oh, I guess I should mention, the reason for the urgency is because Soren launched a trilithium torpedo into the system's sun, causing it to go supernova. So, let's recap up to this point. We have a guy desperate to return to do his research, which he conveniently can't explain. All of the times in TNG we dealt with someone who was obsessed with their work, we never thought to assign a security detail to follow this obviously deranged man everywhere, even off the ship? Nah, just let him go to the array. It's fine. On top of that, he has a device that can seamlessly nuke any star. Like, I get it. He's been working on this project for 300 years, but a device of this kind of power is galaxy-ending. This makes the nuclear weapons of today seem like a child's toy, especially when you consider this device can be easily launched from a missile on a planet's surface. The Klingons thought Genesis was a mass extinction device. Yeah, Imagine having your entire empire decimated in mere minutes with a small handful of missiles. This is why you don't start with a concept and force it into place. Any number of time-traveling stories could have been way better. Hell, The Guardian of Forever would have been an amazing way to have both Kirk and Picard work together and would have been the most appropriate passing of the torch. But no, Magical Nexus bullshit is clearly the better choice. So Soren gets away and the Enterprise is forced into a retreat. Data and Picard have a moment in this rather impractical display setup that was clearly designed for cinematic creativity and not any practical purpose like most Star Trek sets typically are designed. They figure out that Soren is going to the Viridian system based on some dead reckoning projections and simulations. This is the high point of intelligence with this film. It's all downhill from here. So they call Soren's bluff, and Picard offers himself as a prisoner exchange for Geordi. Turns out, Geordi had his visor messed with, but doesn't know it. Hold on. Did everyone forget that time Geordi tried to assassinate someone after being subjected to Tal Shiar brainwashing and visor tampering? Am I to believe that Starfleet didn't see fit to fully examine all equipment for the visually impaired in the event they were captured? It's like the writers of this film didn't even watch the source material. So, through the magic of video streaming, the Dura sisters are able to match the frequency of the Enterprise's shield harmonics, so their weapons can go right through. Riker, for whatever reason, decides to withdraw, even though they have faced this problem before. Remember that time with the Borg? Remember the cutting beam? Remember rotating the shield frequency? No, of course not, because then the plot would get in the way. <clears throat> They have found a way to penetrate our shields. You mean like that time when we faced the Borg? Okay, I'm rotating the shield frequency. Mr. War, fire phasers and standby torpedoes. Their shields are collapsing, sir. They're getting ready to cloak. Fire. Riker to Picard. Yes, number one, what is it? The Dura sisters opened fire. Initially, they were able to penetrate our shields, but I rotated the frequency like that time with the Borg and quickly destroyed them. We're standing by to beam down. Negative. Lock weapons 500 yards north of my position and open fire! 
So the Enterprise gets her butt kicked embarrassingly hard. They manage to convince the ship to cloak and... Gash. Well, what about all of that equipment we're carrying to catalog gaseous anomalies? Would you care to assist me in performing surgery on a torpedo? Use a torpedo to... Where's that damn torpedo? She's ready, Jim! Lock and load! Fire! Destroy it. Fire. Wow. Shamelessly recycled the footage, too. Gee, it's as if we've seen this before. Literally. The Enterprise has an epic crash. Everyone dies. <laughs> okay, not right away. But after the crash, Soren shoots his hyper-fast missile that doesn't even so much as mildly pop when breaking all physics of time and space to cause the Viridian Star to go supernova. This causes Magical Ribbon Plot Device to change course and scoop up Picard and Soren before the shockwave destroys Viridian 3, killing everyone else on the Enterprise. There it is. The moment Roddenberry's Star Trek ends. Picard is taken off to Nexus Fairytale Land where he experiences a reality where he has a wife and children, but in old France or London. Or rather, the family and children are dressed like it's the Victorian era. This makes no sense. Oh, and Guinan is there for convenient exposition reasons. Long and short, Guinan convinces Picard to seek out Kirk who just got to the Nexus when he saved the Enterprise B from certain destruction, except that Soren was on a ship that was going to make it to the Nexus before they interfered, so if the Enterprise got sucked in, they could have... <sighs> After Kirk relives some memories, he's in a state of ignorant apathy as he tries to figure out when and where he is. Eventually, he's convinced that it's all some kind of illusion and that the right thing to do is to go back in time with Picard, which they can do for some reason, and save the day. And this is where the expanded multiverse era of Star Trek begins. So I guess they can just pick a point to return to, but in doing so, I guess none of them thought to bring a phaser. Nope, just two old guys gonna duke it out with another old guy in classic fisticuffs. Exciting. They eventually beat Soren and he dies when his missile is locked in place and simply explodes, blowing up the movie's entire budget in the process. Picard buries Kirk and then returns to his down command to retrieve artifacts and everything is tied neatly in a bow. Despite all the obvious trauma of finding out that you were the last of your family line and losing your ship and burying a legend you just convinced to leave Magical Fairy Nexus place, all of this happening in a single day. But nope, it's all good because Star Trek always ends happy, I guess. It is worth noting that Picard's character change makes perfect sense for the follow-on TNG films, but I doubt anyone actually thought of that when they wrote those other multiverse properties. And then, of course, there is the greatest sin that Generations commits, and that is killing Kirk with a bridge of all things. One of the biggest problems that people have with current culture is the ruining of our heroes. And yet, this one gets a free pass... Well, okay, it didn't always get a free pass, but you want to know where the precedent was set for current era Trek? There you have it. Now you're probably wondering, how does this end Roddenberry Trek when Picard went back in time and changed things? We've seen time travel in Star Trek before. How is this any different? Because up until this point, Trek did a good job of maintaining closed-loop time travel stories. Everyone either resurrected or events were predetermined and had to happen to fulfill the timeline's obligations. Yesterday's Enterprise is a closed-loop story because it's really just the story of the Enterprise C going to an alternate future told from the perspective of the alternate universe Enterprise D. Does that mean there were two Tasha Yars the whole time? Well, seeing as the alternate universe one did everything she could to not contaminate the timeline and that there's no confirmation on the show one way or the other, yeah. In Generations, Picard is the only one who goes back and changes the outcome. He does not bring back the people who died on screen. He's in a new reality. 
If Generations was a closed loop, then Kirk would have disappeared the second the ribbon passed over Viridian 3. No, just because he died doesn't mean the paradox was fixed. This is Star Trek, not self-correcting paradox Futurama. As soon as the ribbon passed, neither Picard nor Soren were scooped up, meaning Picard couldn't go back to get Kirk to bring him to his present, I think we get the idea. So it's not a closed loop, meaning the second Kirk magically arrives, we're in an alternate timeline. And from there, all kinds of alternate timelines spawn. One where the Borg are discovered 200 years earlier, one where Spock has an adopted sister, one where Anunian Singh served on the Enterprise, one where ATVs are apparently practical in a world with anti-grav, and one that was kind enough to spell it out for you that it was straight up its own thing. That is not it. He said he wanted me to see something, the destruction of my home planet. How the hell did they do that, by the way? And where did the Romulans get that kind of weaponry? The engineering comprehension necessary to artificially create a black hole may suggest an answer. Such technology could theoretically be manipulated to create a tunnel through space-time. Damn it, man, I'm a doctor, not a physicist. Are you actually suggesting they're from the future? If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. How poetic. Then what would an angry future Romulan want with Captain Pike? As captain, he does know details of Starfleet's defenses. What we need to do is catch up to that ship. Disable it, take it over, and get Pike back. We are technologically outmatched in every way. A rescue attempt would be illogical. Near a ship would have to drop out of warp for us to overtake well, Then him. what about assigning engineering crews to try and boost our warp yield? Remaining power and crew are being used to repair radiation leaks uh, in the lower decks okay, and damage right, to some right. communications without There's which we got cannot to be contact some way. Starfleet. We must gather with the rest of Starfleet to balance the terms of the next engagement. There won't be a next engagement. By the time we've gathered, it'll be too late. But you say he's from the future, knows what's gonna happen, then the logical thing is to be unpredictable. You are assuming that Nero knows how events are predicted to unfold. The contrary, Nero's very presence has altered the flow of history, beginning with the attack on the USS Kelvin, culminating in the events of today, thereby creating an entire new chain of incidents that cannot be anticipated by either party. An alternate reality. Precisely. So there you have it. Every complaint about modern day Star Trek can be traced all the way back to generations. Star Trek died in 1994. Though I take issue with this, as Star Trek will never die. Roddenberry Trek ended and is over. If we really want to try a series following the Roddenberry Bible, as I said, I'm not confident it'll last long. No conflicts within the crew is unrealistic. That should certainly be the standard to strive for, but I mean, we're all still human in the end. Mistakes will happen. Deep Space Nine is good because it allows for the conflicts, but it resolves them in the way we expect Star Trek to resolve them. And that's what matters in the end. Do fans learn the core ideas of Star Trek? You may not like certain Trek multiverse properties, and that is okay. The point of this video is not to end criticism, rather the opposite. Its intention is to point out that the sins Star Trek commits are nothing new and haven't been for some time. I have my timeless Trek pieces. I don't need DS9 repackaged for the modern day. I also don't need to tell people that the product they choose to enjoy is bad. And that brings us to the final piece, what makes a real fan. As I briefly mentioned in the beginning, it's respecting the core principles of tolerance, acceptance, diversity, and inclusion. And yes, this means all ideologies. Look not at what people say, but how they are by their actions. People can have monumentally stupid ideas and even be as arrogant as ever, but if they aren't harming anyone by their actions, then your issue is simply with their ideas and, well, everyone has a right to exist and have ideas. Ideas are bulletproof. Ideas like Star Trek are timeless. Ideas exist and they cannot unexist. Many have tried to censor ideas with book burnings, propaganda, shaming tactics, and all other forms of anti-Star Trek authoritarianism, and all have failed. Thus, bad ideas are simply defeated with better ideas, as has always been the norm since the dawn of time. Bad Star Trek is simply defeated with better Star Trek. But art is mostly subjective. It's okay to challenge fans on why they love a certain Star Trek. But it's not okay to belittle a fan for liking something that you don't and vice versa. The toxicity can flow in all directions. As a Star Trek fan, I feel I have an obligation to help mitigate toxicity as much as possible per the core values, and I hope I have done that here. Regardless of your favorite Star Trek, I think we can all respectfully agree that the Roddenberry era ended in 1994, and the current expanded multiverse era began. Thank you for watching. If you made it this far, please consider a like and subscribe, and a share of this video. 
Also consider hitting the notification bell if you want to know when we go live or post a video right away. We host a podcast every Tuesday, as well as an open forum live show every Friday, and have regular gaming streams throughout the week with more content like this and other stuff planned. We are also currently taking suggestions. Thanks again, and live long and prosper.